Now after helping my brother farm for a few years, I decided to buy my own land and start farming. So I found an old 4020 and both the tractor and land will need some work to get back into production. We'll spend the next year working hard and learning while making plenty of mistakes along the way. From making small square bales from scratch to growing my first corn crop and in the end we'll see if we make a profit. I want to just kind of service it, get familiar with it, get fluids changed, just basic stuff. Um, and then it might have overheated in the past at one point. So figure that out. Right now it's at the Mann Family Farms. And so I was going to have them kind of help me too uh, and figure things out because they know a lot more about the stuff than I do. So I can fit it on a trailer. I can pull a small disc with it and get this ground ready for the spring right away. That's why I'm buying this. So he already drained the coolant, hydraulic, and oil. We're going to do new batteries. There's the seat. Also got uh, a light kit for it, LED light kit. So that'll be a upgrade. These two work, right? Yeah, this one works, yeah. The tractor was built in 1966. It's got 7,500 hours on it. It sounds like the clutch was rebuilt maybe a couple decades ago. Right now, the hydraulic couplers on the back are leaking, and that's why it's all dirty back there. It's got the synchro transmission, not the power shift. And then maybe down the road, I'll get a canopy for it. But so far, enjoy the tractor. Paid 8,500 bucks for it. All right, so the 4020 is done, and now we're gonna go pick up a disc with it. I just bought a disc like five miles away from here, and we are 30 miles east of my farm. And so jump in the 4020, go hook up to the disc. Then I'm gonna have Josie drive behind in hazards with the pickup, and then we'll take the disc and the tractor to the farm before the sun sets. So all the lights work. The only concern we have is that we don't know if it overheats because the previous owner said it might overheat. That's an easy fix. Yeah, that's what it, it looked like. It's this hose right here. Blew on the engine block heater, Ooh. which you can see right there. Look at that. Yeah, hole right there. So what's ironic about this, Spencer, is my buddy lives about a mile up through the hillside there. He says, what are you doing driving a 4020? Well, if you have any trouble and you need my trailer, I'm just getting it unloaded. So thanks for jinxing us, Kenny. Well, we had these, so, they had these on here but he must have had a farther hydraulic set up. This is, they're way too long. We don't need those. So we're gonna put John Deere tips on here, which Josie, our lovely assistant is holding here. Mm -hmm. We're gonna put these on here cause these are John Deere tips. These are ISO tips, so. This is old school and new school? This is old school, this is new yeah. school. Yeah, so we're putting old school back on because, because this is old school tractor. Hey guys, quick shout out to my brother Grant and the team at Squad Belt for releasing a mobile game focused on true American farming with realistic fields and everything from old farm all M tractors to a brand new case quad track. Check out American Farming, link down below. So this is where it's gonna sit for at least a day or two. Tomorrow's Easter. And then, so we're gonna replace that hose on the other side on the block heater. Probably replace this one too while we're at it. Obviously top off the coolant and see if we're good from there. We were five miles into the drive. It was five miles from man's place to get the disc. And then we're about a little over 25 miles away from the farm. So at least we know, figured out one thing that's wrong with it. So this is the disc, it's 14 foot wide. Wide. It's a John Deere. Tires hold air. The hoses look fine. This is what I'm going to use to tilt the ground. All right, we fixed the hose and topped it off with coolant. So we'll see if there's any leaks. All right, we got it hooked up. Hydraulics connected. Raised up as far as it'll go. Then we replaced two hoses. And this is the one that broke. Alright, 
pulling in. We made it. This is the farm. So that disc isn't doing as good as I would want it to, but I paid 800 bucks for it, bought it literally last minute, just five miles away from where uh, we were working on the tractor, so that worked out good. There's eight mile an hour winds out of the south. Perfect day. Rained a little bit last night, just a bit. And then uh, it's it's April 10th, so the grass is pretty green underneath. We dissed around this piece. We're gonna burn this 20 acres. Then there's about 10 over there that we'll burn. We started in that corner and it came to this corner. Perfect. It's the next day after the burn. The ash isn't too bad. I think back burning it was a good idea. It burned it really thick and good. We're getting all this cleared out and stuff and should work good. Just two of those big trees, probably cut the stump with the chainsaw. So we're just wrapping up, getting all the brush piled up. But this is kind of the finished product. The slow back burn worked out really good. I'm gonna jump in for the first time with the 4020. We got some extra weight on that. I want those roots gone, or I, w I want the little trees uprooted somehow. So I think the disc will do it. We have the extra weight. It's going a heck of a lot deeper. We did a little test strip there, but uh, the disc isn't great. I wish it was heavier, but we, we made it heavier and hopefully it doesn't break or anything. Two days into actual clearing after the burn. I think it's going pretty good and we're taking our time getting it really, really clean. This is 30 year old CRP, so the roots are holding on still. This part of the process by far was the most time consuming. My parents will come out at night to help pick up some sticks. Grant's here in the tractor and I'm staying ahead in the skid steer, smoothing out like all the holes, ant hills. And when the neighbor was transplanting the trees, a lot of times it wasn't perfect great. So I'm just staying ahead of them here. The wheel bearing went out on the disc here, which I wonder why that happened. Maybe it has something to do with the log we put on it. Um, I just got to take off the old bearing. Part of the old bearing still stuck on here and kind of nothing was left. So I got new stuff, hopefully it fits. It should be good, it turns by hand, it's not too hard or anything, but it's not crazy loose, carpet pins in. The seal on the back should hold for what it's doing. Finally done with, this would be the east field, the 30 acre field. Finally done with it, got everything. I can walk away from it and they dropped in hydrous tanks off and so they'll be doing that. I gotta run over and dish the, the west side, the smaller of the fields on the other side of the creek real quick. Very surprised that this held up. The gang squeak quite a bit. There was not, there was no squeak. One of these squeaked really bad.
awesome to sit in a tractor and farm the farm the long way versus going around and we're able to go through the waterway here and going through the Missouri crossing it's a little tight maybe in the future I might put in a crossing here so that's, that's Well, I think if that can make it through, our planner should be able to. Maybe the markers on the planner rub. The only thing I think is I would widen out. I think this is a hair tighter than uh, the other side, but worked out good. We'll get connected to the other tank and finish the last five acres. No broken shanks. That was super surprising. It was now time to drive 90 miles with my brother's tractor and planner to the field. I had borrowed a neighbor's field cultivator and hoped to be planting the next day we got there. We got shut down by five inches of rain over the next week and learn what happens to field tile when it gets clogged with tree roots. Thankfully, I had my lovely assistant Josie here to help get the planter and tractor ready for the long trip down the road. While she was airing up tires, I was switching over from soybean back to corn plates and we got everything greased, aired up, ready to go. Of course, we had to fuel up. It was going to be a 90 mile drive. And then she took the truck with the side by side and she met me there and gave me a ride home. I think top speed in this 23, 24 mile an hour. So I guess I made four hours. Hopefully nothing goes wrong. Pulling it with the tractor, you have all four hydraulic cylinders down pressure on four tires. Whereas if you're pulling this with a pickup with no hydraulics, you only have two. So it should uh, be less weight on wheel bearings, tires. It should ride a heck of a lot smoother. So here we go. Quick stop at the halfway point, make sure nothing's too hot. Josie's already ahead of me. She's brought her book. Today is just the drive up there day. It's supposed to get some rain this morning. We did, and then possibly rain this afternoon too, but tomorrow's gonna be like 80, the day after that, 85. As long as it's not enough rain to, to not go, which I don't think it will be. It will be planting tomorrow. All right, we made it four and a half hours later about how much time it took. Everything went good. It, it was about four and a half hours, so a little more than I thought. Did burn a lot of fuel, that's for sure. Rode a lot smoother with the, I bumped the tire pressure up to like 25. See if the planter fits through. And Hydra's bar did. I think the planter will, but the planter is pretty dang big. Pretty wide. So nice and easy. Renting that cultivator, I think it's 28 foot wide. Had the dually pole. It's good. It's good. No issue? Nope. All right. So the goal today is, is to repair this waterway main that broke. It's an eight inch tile. It's been sucking a lot of dirt through it. The hole I was standing to in the previous clip is right there. And if you follow the waterway buried three deep below in the ground is a clay tile. And the reason why they call it a clay tile is because it was actually made out of clay. And back in the day, decades and decades ago, they used old trenches at one mile an hour and slowly dropped in these clay tile. The purpose of this clay tile is to drain surface water and to lower the water table so then your crops can yield better. Now somehow this eight inch clay tile has broken and in the past years, it's created this suck hole. While it rains, it's also sucking down dirt through the opening and taking it out to the creek. So it'd be nice to just get this repaired. We can drive right over it. It's flowing quite a bit of water, and that is eight inch plastic to clay. It dumps where the excavator is into the creek down there. I think it's broken right here, but we'll keep walking back and probably connect. Hopefully to here, there's a good spot. I think I should have brought my uh, mud boots. Forgot to bring those. The 
best way I've found to make connections from plastic to clay, clay being a bit bigger than the plastic, is you got to make some slits to expand it. And then once you slide it over, you can towel tape around it to make a good seal. Here I am measuring out the distance, getting a rough idea. Do the same thing on the other side. So you have clay and clay on one side. Here I'm using the excavator bucket to kind of dam up the water so we aren't getting flooded with water. Fit in the downhill side and then quickly run to the uphill. Try and shove it on there. And now I'm realizing, yep, we made it a bit too long. So quickly run to the downhill side cut it make it a bit shorter that was kind of a pain and everything worked out good so the biggest thing is to backfill it properly to seal it up and that way you don't have like a big chunk of dirt right next to it and it doesn't backfill right Once we patched the sinkhole and drove the tractor down, the next few days it rained a total of four inches and we found a problem with the tile. You can see right here, water bubbling up. And I think it's a tile. I don't have a bunch of experience identifying this type of stuff. Waterway comes through here, neighbor's property. I know there's an eight inch main. Most likely that would run at the lowest point, which would be the middle of the waterway. So maybe the tile makes a turn or there's something here that is backed up. All right, so we're gonna get muddy. This is above where I made the last tile repair. So guessing this is gonna be an eight inch. It's flowing, uh, something's broken obviously. A bunch of water's flowing up where I put those flags and then it flows down into the waterway and there's a bunch of standing water. So we're gonna dig, figure out, hopefully everything works. And I brought my swim trunks in case I gotta go swimming. We're gonna have Grant run the excavator today. So at this point, we knew water couldn't go downstream, and as we were digging, water was filling up in the hole. That means the blockage is downstream, and we haven't yet confirmed that the 8-inch main I patched is the same one we're working on here. This could be a different tile. I'm new to the farm, don't know any of the tile history, don't have tile maps. So we kind of have to dig, hit the tile, find the tile, find out what the heck's going on, and then go from there. So we're going to be digging some holes. Wait. I hit it with the shovel. Yeah, I think we're filling up, aren't we? Alright, there's the tile. The tile was right there. Alright, now we'll see if it's closed. Now at this point we've confirmed it's the eight inch clay main. I went down there with my hands and felt it. And so we said, screw it. We're above the blockage. Let's straddle the main and start digging a trench backwards in hopes that we, we keep breaking it, breaking it. And then it starts sucking water once it hits a clear spot or a spot that's not broken. And while we were doing this, I thought to myself, wait a second, about right where the excavator is sitting, there was a big, big tree that we took down. Of course, the roots from the tree are clogging it, but we still aren't 100% for sure, and we need to rule out other things. Like the repair I made a few days earlier, I could have botched that repair, and that has blocked it all the way up here. Most likely not, but we do need to rule that out before we start digging a mile-long trench. So in the course of the last week, we've gotten four and a half, close to five inches of rain, and we're still here trying to figure out this tile. Diverting some of the water coming off the waterway. We're back to where I made this... Uh, this fix and we're gonna we're gonna rule this out we're gonna rule out that me connecting this didn't make it we're figuring things out oh there we go where the f is that we stuck sewer tape up there i think this thing goes 40 foot nothing it's flowing good so that means our blockage is down there. Now there's a giant tree over there that we think might have caused the blockage that Spencer tore out. We're gonna go check downstream of where the tree was, somehow kind of get it open without breaking it too much, and then throw the sewer tape up, see if we can feel that blockage, and maybe we'll be able to just break through with the sewer tape and feel the blockage. All right, so there's a bunch of, I mean, that root right there we found going through the crack, so. That's uh, that's a big root. We're standing on the where the big old tree was. Take it flat. Oh!
So there's a big tree here that blocked this hole 40 foot. So we're just ripping out the old main. It's, there's gonna be a bunch of water that's gonna flow down here because this is all backed up. I'm gonna slowly let this down. Hopefully we get this all drained down with water and then get it on the same grade. So most importantly, we want to make sure it's still flowing. It's still flowing over here. So that means we're on grade good. Now that both connections are made, water's flowing good, no blockage, no roots in the system anymore. We literally trenched out the whole section that had roots in it. And once we get this done in backfield, I gotta go make three more connections and patch those. We get it all backfilled and made sure to grade it out the best we could because part of where we dug is gonna turn into the field. So after making this repair and all the patch jobs, water's flowing fine. There's been no issues after some pretty heavy rains. And at this point, we gotta wait a few days for the sun to come out and dry everything out before we can start field work and planting. All right, everything's going good. This is technically the second pass on the CRP area. And then we're doing one pass on the soybean. And it, it's breaking up pretty good. I mean, there's still clumps, but that five inches of rain we got, I think helped break it down. Once we get done here, we'll finish the five acres, then the 12 on the other side. If you remember, that was all water about five, six days ago. side of the creek just got done over there this is like 10 12 ish acres here this spot here is by far the worst grass okay back a lot quicker now we're planting we're about halfway done with the 30 acres we're jumping in and out making making sure everything's uh, right, all the adjustments are made and seeds going where it should be. So there we go, up over the waterway. Back down. Okay. 
We're out of seed. I think it was row two or three. Got it all filled up with seed. Should be good. 18 acres done, 30 total, so 12-ish left. All in all, planting was going smoothly, but then Grant and I started to notice the planter rows were looking quite squiggly and not straight. Now the guidance system we have on the 8110 is an ATU 200. So we started to make adjustments to the monitor by changing the sensitivity levels. And after doing that, things would straighten out, but then about 10 minutes, 15 minutes later, things got squiggly again and we would have to make more adjustments. After a while of playing with it, we got it to a point that was good enough or better than I could do by hand. Now after thinking about it for a while, I assume possibly driving it 90 miles down the road and some of the road was quite bumpy, could have messed up the, the globe on the roof, it could have messed up the steering wheel system that's mounted to the steering wheel. So I ended up not getting that much footage of planning because this was my first time really planning by myself and it being a new field I just wanted to focus make sure everything was going right. It was really cool to see after the five inches of rain just how fast the field dried once we fixed the tile and the sun came out but we did end up planning on May 20th which is no big deal. It would have been nice to obviously plan a bit earlier but if we had planned it earlier before that rain a lot of spots would have flooded out. So given the weather I think everything turned out totally fine and we were planning at two and a half to two and three quarters of an inch depth, seed depth, and then the population we planted at was 33,800. And this is a ground drive 12 row planter. And the seed I planted to start out with, we had a couple extra bags of Wiffles 7876 that we wanted to test six rows on so we could see how it compares to Pioneer 1164. The field cultivator I rented was a Case 4800. It had the spikes instead of the drag harrows on the back and didn't really deal with too much of bunching up. I was a bit worried. We got rain for two, three weeks and the grass really started to come back. I was worried the field cultivator would bunch up, not do a good job, but it did 35 days after planting. The corn emerged in seven to eight days. I planted at 33,800 population and the worst spots I saw were the previous sod areas that hadn't been farmed in a few years. And those were the lowest I saw were 29,000 but honestly it more so averaged around 30 to 31 which i was very happy with and up to this point the local co-op has already applied both pre and post spray 30 pounds of uan were in the pre-spray and 150 pounds of anhydrous with the planned top dressing of urea would put us up to 225 pounds of nitrogen all in all planting went really good the corn's growing some spots are rougher than others but we got a bunch of rain today and hopefully we get out of this you know drier weather there's five acres of overgrown grass that needs cut and bailed up and I'll show the whole process from mowing it to making a square bale. And then at the end, we're going to total up how much money we made and how much we spent on equipment and see where we stand. So I brought the 4020 back from the farm and the reading the odometer, we put roughly 50 hours on it this spring between disc in, running around, picking up rocks and stuff. Super happy with it. The only thing that we had issues with is when we were trying to drive it down. I blew that one coolant line. So the main reason I brought the 4020 back is back there, there's about six to about six acres of hay that thinking I might be making the square bales out of. So I bought a sickle mower online at an auction and I'm gonna pick that up tomorrow. It's about a seven foot long, maybe eight foot. It's a John Deere number nine. So hopefully everything works on it. Paid 300 bucks for it. And one of the main reasons I bought the 4020, one, I knew I would need it right away this spring for that farm to disc it up and get it ready. But then also it's super tr easy to trailer and we don't need like a big gooseneck or anything. And according to online, it weighs 8,500 pounds at a thousand for the front loader, 1,500 for the loader in the front and the bucket. It kind of felt like it was the skid steer back there. So I really know nothing about this mower. Well, we turned on the PTO and it uh, worked a little bit there, but 
the main thing that I saw, and again, I don't know much, just watching YouTube videos, trying to figure it out, is this spring is broke. My understanding this spring is that raises and lowers the whole unit. Um, so when you lift up with three point, because this doesn't have a hydraulic uh, raise up and down for the mower, this spring will bring you up like 30 inches or just enough so you can, so the mower's off the ground. The sickle bar mower I bought is a John Deere 350 and it has a seven foot bar. It ran kind of good right away. That main spring is broken so it doesn't lift up off the ground. And later on I figure out I had a couple of adjustments wrong and got it cutting a bit better. But I paid 300 bucks for it. So I think I got a good deal. Some sickle bar mowers were selling for like $1,200, $1,500, you know, working in good condition. And keeping the cost of the tractor out of the equation, I paid 300 for the sickle bar mower. And then I'm going to go pick up a rake that I paid $300 for. It's They're kind of in rougher shape, but it'll work for what I need. So this is a new idea hay rake. I'm guessing it was made somewhere in the 50s, 60s. There's a serial number on it, but I couldn't find much looking it up online. And the reason why I bought this is I thought I'd be able to drive it home and not have to trailer it. But after pulling it down the road a couple miles, those back wheels just were going crazy and I couldn't go over 10, 15 mile an hour. So I thought trailering it would be best. It was a bit of a pain to get on the trailer, but once it was on there, Sagir strapped it down and it rode just fine home. It's a gear drive rake. I think it's a bit wider than the traditional like two wheel rakes that are sometimes gear driver pulleys. And yeah, the only downside is I can't really pull it down the road too good. Maybe I'll mess with it in the future and get it to go down the road better. But right now it's just good enough. So with this being my first time ever around a sickle bar, I thought the best way to figure things out is just to run it. And that was pretty painful and I had to stop a lot of times. The biggest issue I found out later on, I didn't have a hitch pin in the hitch that then lowers and raises the end of the sickle bar. And so essentially when I was going through the field, the end of the sickle bar was just dead weight on the ground and any uneven surfaces on the ground or a big clump of grass, it would catch and then it would hit the trip bar and you'd have to reset it and the sickle bar wouldn't go anymore. And prior to me figuring out that I didn't have this hitch pin properly installed is I tried to fix the spring. So I bought like a cheap one and the spring like hook part was broken. So I cut it off a spring I bought, tried to weld it on, that broke in a couple minutes. So that didn't work. Coupled with the bar always tripping, the sickle sections themselves weren't weren't too sharp and the whole thing was quite dull so it didn't cut very good so I got off the tractor about a hundred times by resetting the the trip lever and then also just shutting off the PTO and unclogging the bar and so there's three acres that you're seeing right now up top then there's roughly another two on the bottom
so I timed the cutting of this hay absolutely terribly and I could, probably shouldn't have done it and waited till this weekend. It's Friday now. Anyway, yesterday it rained another inch and I thought the mower would work better. I just kind of powered through it. Obviously, as you can tell, it didn't cut too good. I had to leave some spots. We have hydrants in the field, two of them. It, it feels all dry to the touch now. It's been, I mean, it's been 90 degrees for a day here and kind of windy. So thinking I'm going to rake it up, bail it tomorrow or the next day, depending when I have time. This stuff I cut, I cut, it would have been two days ago now. Had one day of rain on it. So the underneath is still a little wet, but the top, you can tell, starting to dry out. Pretty much this first time is just like literally learning how to do it. Just bought all the equipment, like, days before and stuff so one thing that's kind of cool about it right now it's in neutral so you just pull this little guy back and then push it in now it's in I think it's in reverse now and then you can you gotta it's a little tricky but if I drive forward a bit then I can put it in forward so starting out I lowered the rake too low and you can see it kind of bind and then eventually after a couple passes it, it was working fine but then the the tines kind of started to bend and after the third or fourth pass it wasn't raking complete and leaving like 20 30 percent behind so I messed with it a bit more and adjusted a few things and I couldn't get it any better I ended up doing the whole field like that thinking I couldn't get it any better but the next day I said, there's gotta be a better way. I put it in reverse and actually the tines then kind of reset back, bent back. I'm gonna rake it one more time, get it absolutely perfect. And then we will bail it tomorrow. Today's gonna be like 90 degrees, not too windy, but should dry it. anything else that's wet and we should be good to bail. That looks way better before it was picking up like only probably half to three quarters of the hay on the ground so anyway that worked way better I wish I would have just done that from the beginning so in between mowing and raking the hay I ended up finding a John Deere 336 square baler and I think these were made in the early 70s and I believe they're the models after 24 the John Deere 24 T square balers but yeah, brought it home. And one of the first things I did on it is I had some time and I just replaced the jack on it. The the one before just seemed weird and I didn't like messing with it. It seemed kind of dangerous, honestly. So just went to Tractor Supply, grabbed one off the shelf and welded up the, the little bracket for it. So I did end up paying $3,600 for it, which is more than what I wanted to. But after doing some research and looking online, it sounded like if you're going to spend any money on a hay operation, spend it on the baler so i ended up kind of splurging a little bit on the square baler but it was nice i was able to purchase it from a nice gentleman and he showed me how it worked and then i just went through the dealer prior and replaced a few parts on it so that was nice and it did end up working good for me and after raking the hay i was gonna bail the next day but then all of a sudden a pop-up thunderstorm showed up and it looked like it was gonna downpour in an hour so i was like hey let's hook with the baler so i had my dad come out and we just hurried and bailed it and it ended up not raining and it but it did rain like a mile north of us but it was kind of stressful and we were just running as fast as we can probably not the best situation to be in
All right, so the the rain actually kind of held off. It was just scattered thunderstorms, but the hay was totally dry. I was just gonna wait till tomorrow. So I think we're like 120 bales or something. I didn't have the, there's a bale counter on the baler, but I didn't, it, it wasn't connected or anything. First time like ever stacking bales and stuff, I kind of screwed up. I think the first layers I was pushing too hard in. And then uh, I think having the back on the wagon when we were going down some of the hills. Anyway, it started to lean forward at the end. Just made it a little, a little more difficult than it needed to be. So anyway, a guy stopped out as we were going, and we might be able to sell some bales to him too. Where I'm at, there's a lot of people with horses and like kind of small acreages with livestock. But I've sold about 64 so far. Just people stopping by, wanting to buy 20 or 40. I gotta count it, but I think we got about 80 left. We're gonna go sell it all at once. Just the lady down the road. So, so hopefully everything works good. I might throw a strap on it or something. I only gotta go a couple miles. And the hay rack was one thing I didn't purchase. This is my brother's. He bought it last year, probably this time, for a farm progress show that we were at, showcasing his new game, American Farming. So it's kind of cool. We put like iPads on it, and kids could come up and play the the mobile game that he's working on. So I was able to save some money on that, and it came in handy to haul this down the road a few miles. So the total comes out to be that we made 141 bales, and I sold them at five dollars a bale, and that's because. About 60-70% of them were pretty small at first. The baler was kind of chunking out some small ones. I know how to adjust it now, and then also I lowered the price because they got some rain on it. But I, before I raked it, I let it dry, I think three days. I was gonna let it dry another four, but then rain was coming, so that was my idea. Price it kind of low. It looks like really what I should price a normal square hay bale for is anywhere six to eight bucks around here is what I see. 141 bales, at $5 bale, comes out to be 705 bucks. So I spent, I spent 350 on the rake, 300 bucks on the sickle mower, 3850 on the square baler, and then 8500 on the tractor. It'll be interesting if I can get two cuts off this, or probably just one. But this ground was wasn't being used for anything anyway, and thought it'd be fun to figure out how to do this. And uh, I haven't I haven't mowed. It's about one and a half, two acres down below. So, and that should be some some thicker stuff. Kind of sits a bit wider. Uh, so we're gonna probably do that next it's gonna rain tomorrow and anyway just over the summer see how many bales we can make and how much money we can uh, kind of bring in off ground that wasn't being really used for anything all right so there's a lot of things not perfect about the sickle bar which is fine it still cuts and everything but two things I I did when I cut the three acres was we broke this little section got a replacement there some of the sickles are pretty bad and then I think the whole bar kind of bent right on the end here. There should be a little, uh, there's this little thing that bolts in here and that acts as like a cutting edge too. And that's kind of all worn out and a lot of these sickles are just bad, bent, cracked. We'll see how crazy I get, but thinking about replacing all the sickle sections. So in hindsight, I should have just took the whole sickle bar off with all the sections still attached, then replaced the sections I needed to, and then also bend it at that point. I just didn't know it was, it, it's really easy to take the bar off. There's just one bolt you you take off and then it kind of pops free and you slide it through. I messed with it here, grinded off some of the rivets, and then once you grind the rivets and then they heat up and expand and, and then you try and tap them through, they actually don't tap through that good. So. Here I'm trying to like bend it back into shape and stuff like that. The end, the last like four sections, I bent that end of the bar. I had too much grass. It wasn't cutting good and I think I was just jamming through it. So I tried, tried my best to fix it. But once I decided to take the sickle bar off, things went a lot smoother. And I learned you just put it on a lip of a vise and you can bang out those old rivets and like super easy if you have a heavy hammer. So I was able to do that on about half of them, but unfortunately I did grind some. So I did spend another two hours because once you grind it, 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 it doesn't like to shear and it doesn't like to punch out. I changed the sections out from rivets to bolts so I can repair them easier in the future and you do have to adjust the guards for that the guards on the sickle mower need to have higher clearance so i had to get four new ones i think so they didn't rub rub on the bolt in the nut but once i slid it back in the bar here then we were cutting good and i think i have everything on this mower fairly well fine-tuned and just a few times does it trip 
on really uneven ground. All right, so there's a mix mesh of about two and a half acres down below. So up there is the three acres in the shed, and then down here is uh, used to be pretty big brush last year. This hillside was like pretty thick stuff. I'll finish all this. So it all is kind of growing up. Some of it's weeds, some of it's not the best stuff, but a lot of it's this whatever grass you call it, maybe brome. I, I don't know much about grass, but anyway, this is what we're gonna cut. We won't go that high up the hill, just kind of cut it down where we drive down and stuff with the pickup so it doesn't rub on the truck but we'll do this and then on the through here there's the creek and we'll come on to the other side and knock that out Should cut like a dream now and I think one of the things that hurt me a lot is it cut so bad I had to get it I felt like I had to get it really low to the ground and then that caused it to hit you know rough spots and then it would trip so maybe now that it's gonna cut better I can go faster as long as the ground's not too rough and then I can go higher so then it won't trip as much so we'll see and then also I've been going like 1200 rpm stuff online some people say like all the way down I see 800 rpm and then I see like 2500 rpm so we're gonna try different speeds see how that goes Right, that worked awesome. Third gear, like 1500 RPM. So much faster. I think anything is better than what I was doing before. This stuff has a lot of thistles in it. Probably whatever I bail here, I'll probably just uh, put it on the burn pile. There's half of it's gonna be weedy thistles. So this is round two, two days ago I cut it. It's like two and a half acres down there, super, super rough. We're gonna go extremely slow. Grant's gonna fall off the rack or something. We gotta pick up some twigs before we start too, probably. And uh, hopefully everything goes good. This is kind of narrow at some spots. Hopefully that tire clears. That's probably a little too steep. There's a lot of big like wood chunks out here because there was a tree down and stuff. So like I said, pretty rough, pretty rough stuff. It'll be rough. Even after running the mower and the rake through it and picking up as many sticks as I could see, there was still quite a bit left behind and sometimes it would get bunched up and a couple times it sounded really bad when it was going through the baler, but we did end up breaking a shear bolt on the flywheel, got that replaced. I kind of tried to do my best to keep as many sticks out of there as possible and it was just pretty rough ground, not too much you could do. As you could tell, last summer this place looked quite a bit different. So it was kind of cool to take some hay bales the year after, but it, it was kind of rough on the baler and I probably shouldn't have baled it. But the hay was dry and the hay was good. It was making good bales. 
In this main section, made good bales, but over by the creek on the smaller little plot we have, we'd have quite a bit of thistles and, and kind of a lot of weeds in spots. So when the bales did turn out bad, I just threw them in the burn pile. <laughs> So we ended up making 70 bales off the bottom two acres that put us at a total of 211 bales on the total first cutting and that's a revenue of around $1,055 which was pretty cool and I did end up selling them all at $5. For the first time I just wanted to get them sold as soon as possible and not take up too much storage in the shed for that long a period of time. Obviously I'm not going to make a lot of money doing these square bales but I thought it was a fun way to kind of get outside, get a workout, kind of go back old school with a uh, small square baler and it was cool to meet some neighbors and people who wanted the square bales they were really appreciative of it Everything was going smoothly and I was now mowing near the road when I had the bright idea right there I turned onto the road and thought I'll make a quick pass along the gravel in the ditch edge and clean that grass up. And 30 seconds in this is what ended up happening. There was a hole I didn't see through the grass. It kind of pulled the tractor in once I hit it. I made a few attempts to get out of it every time getting closer and closer to the edge. I thought I was far enough away I would be totally safe and the only smart thing is I had the rollover protection system on and I ended up just yanking it to the left, flooring it, hoping that I wouldn't tip and I would be able to ride into the ditch and then drive up and out a different way. And this is what the ditch looked like. As you can tell, I didn't make it very far down the road by the time I flipped over and it was a pretty steep angled ditch. But I wanted to include this segment of me being an idiot to remind people not to be an idiot like me and be a bit safer on tractors. And also this is a reminder to always put up the rover protection system on whatever piece of equipment you have. Whether you're in a small tractor, big tractor, or just a zero turn mower, it's probably smart to have it up even if you think it's never going to happen. Because honestly, I was so far away from this ditch in my mind that this was never going to happen. And you could kind of justify not having it up, but it's good I did. I got the tractor flipped over thanks to a neighbor's help and now the engine wouldn't turn over and it was hydro locked because it was on its side for a little too long and oil got into the cylinders and it was locked up. And I did start, try and start it right away which looking at it now online I guess you're supposed to let them sit for a day or two, hopefully the oil drains down and you don't have any issues of hydro locking. And I pulled the valve cover off now because it wouldn't start after after letting it sit for a day. What I'm going to do now, I think, is drain all the oil out of the engine. Here are the glow plugs. I'm going to drain all the oil. I got brought a little portable shot vac, suck out as much oil as I can, and then hand crank it with the glow plugs cracked. Try and get all the oil out of the top of the engine, refill it with oil, and see if it'll start. And the only way to get to the glow plugs was to take the cover off. It would have been nice if I didn't have to, but don't really know what I'm doing. Just looked online, YouTube, and asked some friends. What I'm a little worried about is leaves falling in here or something. All right, there we go. We're getting oil out.
After I got the tractor started, I checked for leaks, made sure there was enough oil in the engine, and it did smoke quite a bit at the beginning, and it slowly got better and better, and about an hour in, it went away. I'm guessing that was oil on the exhaust manifold, and then just oil that was getting burnt. In the end, it was a good learning experience, both to be a little safer when driving the tractor, and then also how to fix it once I got oil into the cylinders. And I got everything mowed and finished up and ready for harvest. So I just wanted to mow the grass along where we're going to drive in and just kind of clean things up and maintain it. And before the whole tractor flipping fiasco, I had some guys come out with their drone and we ended up spraying some fungicide and also source on the corn right when it was starting to tassel. <laughs> Now once they landed, they would fill 10 gallons of product and switch batteries. The batteries were being charged on a generator and only took 15 minutes to charge. So three batteries can keep them going all day. I timed them and it took a minute and 30 seconds on average from landing to taking off again. On one flight, they can do roughly five acres and they typically get 35 acres done in an hour. In these shots, it is late September. The corn's gonna mature really quick, dry down and lose a lot of its leaves and color. Now it really stands out, the different hybrids in the trial that we're doing. What was cool to see, those stripes that I was talking about, those seem to kind of vanish and go away. You couldn't tell anymore. But unfortunately, the best part of the field where we had that planting issue, the fact the seeds weren't there, Obviously, you can't fix that, but it was awesome to see. The corn was about 11 feet tall in some spots, and the ear was head high, so crazy tall corn, and I was praying that a windstorm wouldn't come through and blow it all over. And doing ear checks, they were coming in at 19.3 around on average, and then it looked like the wiffles were a bit shorter at 39 kernels long versus the Pioneer. It averaged 42 long, which is awesome to see, and when you go online and do yield calculators, it was looking like we're going to yield above 200 for sure. We're doing a project on the five ton. The goal is to get a hitch made for this that is about 20, 22 inches off the ground. This is about 33 inches off the ground. To have it 22 to pull wagons, to pull the gravity wagons. The material I got is 3 eighths of an inch thick. Here's more, five by five inch square tubing. Again, 3 eighths, another 3 eighths plate. I got the material from a shorts or a scrap pile. I'll pop up some pictures of what I'm kind of, where I'm getting inspiration for this. There's a few ways to go about it, but there's some guys that did it on deuce and a half, and I only seen one guy that did it on a five ton. That is something I want to do, but I want to drop even lower.
All right, so we got the big clevis off. It's over there. And I just got the left service one off. This is the emergency line for when you're hooking up a trailer and you put your glands on the side here and hook up. And so there's a little bracket and I'll cap this off just like I put a plug on here. But the idea is we're gonna have a plate. I'll probably put four, hopefully I can get a three quarter inch drill bit through here, four bolts, and then it's gonna drop down in the bottom about right here. And so it's gonna look like a field goal post. And this is gonna be our horizontal piece, 3 8 inch, five by five inch square tube. And so it's gonna be straight down about 24, 25 inches, 24, 25 inches. And then that tubing across hits right in the middle and I'll try and reinforce it elsewhere. And this is what we got for our side plate. This is half an inch. The only, this is the only half inch I could find. This is a four foot by eight foot plate. This is the smallest sheet I could buy, but that means I have plenty of room for air. But I want to have it bolt on so then I can take it off because the, the fear with this is when I back up with something, it's going to hit my hitch before it hits like the pumpkin or whatever, but before the tires are able to ride with it up. So if I know I'm not going to use it for like months and months and months and I'm going to use the truck a lot moving dirt and stuff, I'll be able to, to take it off. All right, both tires are off. All the stuff in the way is off. That big clevis that was right here, that's out of the way. So I think we're officially ready. Here was the idea. So this is three, three eighths thick. This is half inch thick. I spent a lot of time drilling these holes, half inch, half inch. The reason why it looks absolutely terrible is because I was originally gonna do six and then I was like, oh wait, I'm only gonna do four. And then the drilling was harder than I thought. And so that was combination of changing plans over and over. That's why it looks bad. Other side has two, three quarters and three half inch holes, but half inch, half inch. And so that is uh, lock nut on the inside. And then I'm thinking we're gonna weld all around both sides, we'll leave it sticking out. We're gonna do instead of the two inch receiver or shank, whatever you wanna call it, it's gonna be two and a half. So it should be a bit stronger and that's a thought. And then maybe have triangle pieces here. There's gonna be no tongue weight with the gravity wagon. It's all gonna be uh, forward and back, maybe a little side to side, but it's mostly gonna be jerky. And yeah, those are pretty strong. So hopefully this works. We'll cut off as much excess we need. I made it a bit longer just in case. And maybe take off some back here just for room if things move and stuff. So it's coming together pretty good. So we got it all welded up and it ended up, we, we danced between the stick welder and the, the MIG or the flux core. We're gonna do, I think, gussets here. This is more important, I'm worried about this right here, the side plate bending because the excess force getting pulled on it this way. That's why I went with half inch side plate and then at three eight cross member, five by five inch. This looks pretty thin. 
and I don't see any real reinforcement. Now he doesn't drop as low as I do. It's pretty close and he did do some angle iron there. Later in the video, you're gonna see me do gussets like this all around, trying to strengthen as much as I can do a spine in the back. So if you guys have any tips or tricks or feedback that you would have done differently, let me know in the comments. I'm always open to feedback and learning. I'm getting ready to cut out a hole for the, this is a two and a half inch receiver. I was thinking about a three inch, but our, our five by five inch tubing wouldn't take it. So I tried to get the heaviest duty receiver I could find. I'm gonna try and weld up more supports for this and stuff. This is just a 10 inch receiver. So I'll plasma cut that out. Hopefully I made the front markings and the back markings right. Everything's been going pretty smooth. The drilling of the holes took a while. And uh, I was able to do these gussets here, trying to make it as overkill and beefy as possible. So with the half inch plate, the 3 8 five by five inch tubing, and all the gussets we made, it should hopefully hold up. Because I want to be able to take this off whenever I want to. And so I don't, I don't want to attach anything to the frame of the truck or weld to the frame of the truck. So it's just five bolts on each side. Here's how it's looking so far. Again, this is flux core welding, so it leaves us a bit of a mess, a lot of splatter and stuff, but on my machine, I'm able to weld thicker material flux core. That's why I'm doing it. And I ended up thinking that this would be good to a th uh, three eighths inch little plate here, almost to create a spine for this plate, if that makes sense, because I was worried about when it's up there, it bending this way and stuff. So I think it's coming together. Very interested. This is the final key. A little worried how the receiver is going to go in, but I got a lot better with the plasma cutter. A little bit of slag in there, but that was, dude, I have gotten so much better. I mean, it's not like perfect or anything, but you literally can't be. When I cut out, when I cut out these for the five by five, it was so harder and I was so like more, okay, that was, that was a pretty bad one, but these are pretty straight. I got a little messy up top there, but there we go. That looks good. That actually went through completely. So, I'm gonna leave as much down here as I can to add support. So, I'll go look at what a typical receiver, how far it sticks out with the hole. And then, I'll leave like that much and do some gussets down there and try and make that bulletproof too.
on there. Keep going. We got her full. Thanks to old Lincoln. So this would be a good representation, especially when we come down the hill, pull up the hill. I might try low at first. Uh, one thing I want to see, and we can see if movement is how it butts against this. Like you should see it swing slow. You can't tell it's up. And we aren't even you. We're using this little, you know thin thing in there too. There should be some slop in there. Right. So, but. Yeah, you're sitting pretty square, straight down. So it looks good. Let's take it a shot. Yeah. Hey guys, quick shout out to my brother Grant and the team at Squad Belt for releasing a mobile game focused on true American farming. I've been playing the game during long car rides, spending more time on it than I probably should be, but I genuinely enjoy playing the game and think it's a blast. Check out American Farming, link down below. This is our dump trailer, two 7K axles, and we probably got 12 to 15,000 I would say in here. At least 15, because this is... And so we're just seeing back here how this hitch rides with all this weight. You can see it's solid. You see the thin yeah. suspension moving. Yeah. Heck yeah. That's cool. Thank you. Thank you. So this is more down force or tongue weight. Tongue weight. This is way more tongue weight wherever gonna experience with the wagons. Because the wagons have a front and a rear axle and the front axle is a steer axle. Um, and so yeah, the, the biggest thing is the sheer weight of all the grain in it pushing forward and back. So, but this is a great test. I think this is a good test. And we're, we're going rough off road. This will be kind of like field conditions. I think you're ready for the field. Heck yeah. Didn't even move. Yeah. Solid. You should. Yeah. And now it's time to haul Grant's Combine to my field. Lines and bridges, you cleared perfectly. Yeah, plenty of clearance, and, uh, no problems at all. You're good. That's right. We're good. We're good. By the time we got the combine hauled up and ready to go, it was now mid-afternoon. And sorry about the annoying buzzing sound in the combine. That's a sensor that's broken, and we couldn't figure it out for the first couple days. All right, I just got back with the first load. We filled the wagon like half full. Just, we filled it up with the end rows here so I can get turned around. Grant right now is running on Gary's, the neighbor who is running the grain cart. This is basically gonna be our runway here for Gary to grain cart through Spencer's farm. We're gonna go do Gary's now. Here's the fence line between Spencer's farm and technically my new farm now. First time we got equipment on it. We are rolling with Gary. He's got his 4640. 
and then a uh, 650 bushel cart there. It's working good. We got Gary full there. Man, I love his setup. The 4640 and the 650 demo, it's about like a perfect combination. We are getting rolling for harvest day two here. Got the combine started. Got Gary's tractor warming up. While they were harvesting, I'm running the wagons into the local co-op. It's nice that it's only a few miles away and gravel roads for most of it. I timed it, it takes me about 40 minutes for a round trip, and when I'm back, they have a cart full, which is perfect timing. And we got the last six rows. And... There we go. She is done. She is done. Now we're heading to Spencer's. I think the game plan is, I talked to Gary. Gary's gonna let us use his cart, which is actually gonna work really good. Here we are opening up the 30 acre piece and I can't imagine how Grant combined for days on end with the buzzer going off like that. I got so annoyed right away I scrolled on forums until I saw how to get it turned off later on. The sun was going down when we were finishing the end row so we quickly filled up Grant to take one more load in. Alright this was a uh, of wet dirt mud and this is big i mean that's up to my knees right there so grant came through here with the wagon fully loaded and i didn't show him exactly where not to drive like this right here is the wettest spot dry dry well somewhat dry he went right down the worst spot so i am surprised the wagon did not break something the amount of force that was getting pulled through here and here i mean the six by six is gonna rip it off all right so it's saturday the second day of harvesting here and we ended up finishing Gary's and then now we're on to mine and I think I got about 10 acres done of the 40 roughly 43 acres that we're gonna do here so the five acres here um, really got taken out by like the the trees and then all the trees here but in the middle it was yielding pretty good did all the end rows on the 30 acres and I haven't touched the other side of the creek the like 11 acres we got some deer eating all the corn I shot out the back of the combine All right, I might have spilled a little bit of corn. No corn goes to win. That's right. <laughs> Sacrifice the hat. <laughs> it's 
good enough. We gotta feed a little for the squirrels. We probably did that. Okay, so your first farm harvesting, what are you thinking so far? But probably farm average will come in around like 180, 190 with the end rows and everything combined. And I'm excited over there. There's the end rows should all be good over there. So if we section that off, that'll be a good representation. Hopefully the combine doesn't plug up a bunch. We'll go slow and then we have all the time in the world today and finish tomorrow. Grant earlier mentioned the corn head roller in one row was acting up a few days earlier when taking out my end rows. Well, that went away when we were in Gary's corn and his being drier there weren't any issues until we switched to mine. With my stuff not being as dried down and the stalks being so tough, the worn out roller started to really struggle and bunch up. To keep the combine moving and not stopping every 10 feet, we increased the header speed, which unfortunately causes a little bit more header loss, and then just slowed down the ground speed of the combine. So it seemed like those were the best two combinations to keep it from bunching up the least amount as possible. And when lifting the header up, you can see how worn out those roller fins are. But I can't complain, we're still moving and yields are better than expected. All right, we are on the far east next to the railroad tracks here and we're getting off the end rows. And then right now I'm in Pioneer and the one we just did to the left is Wiffle. So we'll be able to see what yields better and all that kind of stuff. So, oh, that's what happens. So that is not good. One of the rollers is bad and it plugs up. We think we dialed in the yield monitor just about perfect. This next load should be accurate down the middle of the field and we'll see what it yields. thinking about taking that row apart it's not the row that I just undid but we're thinking we'll just kind of grind through it keep an eye on it and I've been keeping such an eye on it that I miss that other row that hasn't clogged all day so going like two mile an hour we'll just go slow through it hopefully we don't do anything do any more damage load yields up to 230 so things are yielding better kind of uh, our own jobs here. So my dad's running the grain cart here. Gary's grain cart he let us use, which actually works really good because we don't have to unhook wagon. And uh, that works super nice. And I'm trucking, Spencer's military truck, and Spencer's combine. So that buzzing noise is the straw chopper warning alert going off. This pulley system drives the back of the straw chopper. It kind of like shreds all the stuff that comes out the back. There's a sensor in this cover here, behind this cover, 
the bearing going around and around. So if that bearing were to go out and it wasn't spinning anymore, the sensor senses it and it says, hey, stop before you plug up the back and damage more stuff. So we swapped out the sensor, that wasn't the issue. We chased up some of the wires, that wasn't an issue. And I've been reading more forums and found one that I hadn't read before because this issue has been going on all of corn harvest. And Grant's been combining the whole time. I don't know how he lives with it. He said he just put in the AirPods and turned up the music, but I'm getting annoyed of it. And so I'm wondering, I think we over greased this bearing at one point and shot grease everywhere. That's what I originally thought was wrong with it. On the sensor, there was grease. We swapped out the sensor. Swapped it out to this one. I think all we have to do is take, unplug this guy right here and plug it into this and that's the bypass. When you're harvesting a different crop or something, I don't think <clears throat> I don't think you want this straw chopper. And so some people don't want that buzzer going off when they're going the whole time. So I think there's a built-in bypass and we could have saved Grant like three days, four days worth of headache. So I unplug this guy, then just plug this in. This totally makes sense. And I think this totally makes sense. I don't know why. I just didn't see it on a forum before, or I didn't find that. I'm gonna test that out first. If it doesn't work, sensor, bearing, indicator spinning. All right, it's not beeping anymore. The whole time in here is just beeping. And uh, yeah, so we're gonna fill the grain cart and then be done for the night. None of the wagons have tarps on them, and they're saying pretty good chance of rain, like midnight tonight. Otherwise, we'd fill those, tarp them, and then take them in in the morning after the rain, and you can't combine yet. That was my original plan. You combine until dark here. We're just gonna fill the cart, because it's got a tarp. We got two tenths of rain, and two tenths of rain is just perfect to make everything greasy. We're stuck. Here we go. Let's see what he does.
Okay, Spence is gonna need speed and momentum. On second thought, we probably shouldn't pull this full wagon up that crack. You guys better thank me. I think it was worth it. The other thing, the truck usually always climbs out of there. She got a little stuck, but uh, she was just a little slimy. The Cornet is a little clapped out right now. We got stock rolls on the third row that aren't grabbing correctly. So it doesn't help when we're in any type of wet moisture stock. It just plugs like crazy. And then we got some weird sounds coming from the left side, which we looked at, it's vague. And that's how we're gonna keep it until we finish those last 14 acres. We're not stopping because we got like three or four days worth of rain coming and it's going to get very greasy and muddy if we don't finish so we're going to try and get finished here today all right grant thinks he figured out what row is going bad he thinks it's the far left one which isn't the one that's been plugging banging noise you're going to hear we think it's the left one we're going to try and test each row One o'clock now, it's a perfect fall day. It's gonna get all the way up to 75 degrees. We're doing anywhere 320 to 200. Load yield we just reset is 225. Totally happy with the yields and better than I could have kind of thought. With the corn head acting up so much and it plugging so often, I have to keep the head speed up and then we're actually going pretty slow. So going probably 1.6, 1.7 mile an hour. Officially done with the 30 acres right now field average is 210 bushels things are going actually pretty good besides that guy over there pretty cool stuff going and seeing all that I was always curious what it was gonna yield it's honestly fairly like consistent and anything that is dark green is 230 or better I think we gotta cross the creek All right, we are starting 10 acres left. It is 2.15. We should uh, should be able to get this just fine here. The tallest corn right here, this is gonna be very interesting. I'm gonna jump in here. This corn is 11 and a half feet tall. So a little bit of weight did a lot, but that's the worst spot by far. Yeah, this stuff is yielding awesome. Besides when I plug, it's not awesome, but that's, uh, that's okay. There it did 225 on end rows, point rows. I think this is going to yield better, but it is kind of a weird shape. So you end up with a lot of point rows that deduct your yield. It's where you're pretty much double planting and then all the plants, some of them then kind of fall over because they have to compete with each other because there's twice as many in one, uh, one spot. So I've just been hauling for Spencer all day, but we got this guy, Ty the farm guy. He stopped me at the co-op and his dad's in front of us. What's your dream job? To farm. To farm. Okay, what's the new mobile game that's gonna come out? America Farming. Yes, nice. 
All right, we're gonna make some adjustments real quick to the combine. Seems like a bit too much is coming out the back. We got low fuel, so we're gonna top it off. Grant picked up a hitchhiker at the co-op. What's up? Nothing. Picking up all the ears that I, I, I miss when I combine. Yeah, if you find any ears, toss it in the header. It's pretty slow going with the head, because that happens. We're on the last five acres. We're not gonna stop now. We're gonna hammer down nice and slow. We have two hours till the call closes. If we can't get the last load in, that's totally fine. I'll just come back tomorrow driving in and been fun. It's just that one row. It would be nice to have fixed it before coming here, but we didn't know it was this, this big of an issue. And I think, uh, I think the good stock health of the corn kind of amplifies the problem. A little update. It's, uh, we brought in the last load of corn, but we're still combining, so we technically won't finish till tomorrow because we'll bring in one more wagon load, but it is, uh, it's yielding pretty good over here, and the field average is coming up to 211, which is cool to see, and then we are uh, still plugging away at one and a half mile an hour, and we could run out of fuel. I, I am out of fuel in my transfer tank in the pickup truck, You gotta sing to her. Slide all the way down, shut her down, start her up. And drop back down. If we were going one and a half mile an hour and it plucked up on us. And I should have went a bit slower into that. Lovely. That one was my fault. That one was my fault. The last corn stocks for 2023 with a cornet that's about to explode. And she made it. How was harvest? What did you think of your first harvest? If you said in the springtime that the farm was gonna yield, this field was gonna yield 215, I'd be super happy and stuff. But then obviously you sit in the combine with Grant's 80 acres that did 270, it's like, oh dang, uh, that's doing really good and stuff. And when we come out here over the summer and coming up to the fall, looking at ear size and all that, you're like, oh wow, this could do, you know, 250, so. But there's so many uh, tree edge effects and stuff like that through the field consistently, probably 235, 240. I'll have to uh, double check that. Yeah, super happy, I literally can't complain. It would be nice if the combine was running good. Maybe we left some yield there because we run the head speed really fast, some cobs were jumping out. Maybe the combine isn't fully running up to its, you know, having the combine totally full, so I don't know maybe a little too much out the back too it was just kind of not everything was perfect which it's not going to be the first year is kind of what i'm what i'm thinking so stuff to do probably better next year Grant decided to take the combine to the dealer for service and storage over the winter months and it's really helpful because we don't have a close place to store it just yet. And while leaving he almost ran over a nice buck. He said it jumped out of the ditch randomly and of course he wasn't looking for a deer in a combine. But it was pretty cool to see it run across the field like that and I had half a wagon load to bring in yet. And in the end, we brought in 9,010 bushels of dry corn on 42.5 acres, which brings our total to 212 bushels to the acre for average. Now the really cool part, the iPad that you saw in the combine, it was registering all this data so we can come back, sit on the computer and look at what spots are yielding good, bad, and try and figure out why. So when looking at this, pay attention to the scale because I can really easily make everything look like it's all green and yielding really good. Anything in the darkest shade of green is 280 plus and then the bottom end of green is 225. So anything that is yellow is 225 and below. And so this is pretty cool to see. You can really start to see areas that yield good, possibly wet spots, and then right here on the side is tree damage, 
tree damage and animal damage too, deer damage too. Looking on the south part, I know for certain this is a wet spot right here. And then here it sits wet as well. And in right there too, that was literally a pond this spring. What's kind of cool to see, not really, but all these little red dots are me picking up the head. So, and then you can start to see spots where I had the wiffle seed. We planted wiffles and pioneer and the wiffles, uh, we had some planter issues. So you can start to see that pop up. For example, right here, I know for certain this sits wet because this spring I couldn't plant part of it. And I think it's just the broken tile. So we'll get that fixed, stuff like that we will fix up and then this right here is totally my fault planner issue i double planted here screwed up big time and like little things like that point rows and bad planting does uh does kind of mess up the yield too and one of the best things has got to be you can literally make a rectangle on this map and see what this section yielded so those seven acres it gets into a wet spot to 236 and then the competition we we're running you have wiffles and pioneer it looks like wiffles barely beat it out in this section just by, what is that, five acres? And a super nice thing is you can see side by side the hybrids, what, what they did for yield. And it looks like Wiffles beat it out by a small margin, just five bushels. Let's make a quick new rectangle because we had the Wiffles have a planter issue and just some of the seeds didn't go down in the ground this spring. So this should be a bit more accurate. This is a new square that I highlighted. Wiffles did 236 here, Pioneer did 217, which is just under a 20 bushel yield difference in this part of the field. In the end, my thoughts are we did leave some yield out there with having the comp combine head not running smoothly I saw some cobs kind of flying out and it did seem like there was a lot of loss on the ground from the header but it's kind of one of those things you just make it the best you possibly can and keep chugging along because we were not going to take apart that head right there in the field I don't have a lot of tools on me and then we'd probably make it worse most asked question on my past videos specifically when we were doing some farming stuff was how much I'm gonna make this first year and the reason I'm making this video is just to help somebody out whether you're curious whether you want to know how much you can make off a few acres farming or how much you can make off YouTube channel that's why I'm making this video it's just to help the 10 people out that might take this information and do something with it. The number we're gonna to come to is cash flow. We're gonna leave out some expenses that are to improve the land and look solely at the year over year cost of owning the land and then the yearly cost of uh, the crop inputs. And to start, you have the option between renting land or buying it. I ended up going with the buying route at a public auction. I kind of believe in owning real estate too just as a long-term store value, a good place to put money. Now this spring at an auction, I purchased 50 acres of farmland and that came to this first year, 42.5 of actual tillable ground that we planted and harvested. The purchase price was $396,000. That comes to $9,300 per tillable acre. And then it's $7,700 per acre around the whole entire border. So like the creeks, ditches, stuff that I'm not actually farming, trees, stuff like that. I financed 90% of that and it came to a 4% interest rate. And then the other 10%, the $39,000 was a down payment. And with that, our land cost came to $25,500 or $600 per tillable acre. Now keep in mind, I have property taxes in there as well. And then 9,600 of that 25,000 is actually money going towards the principal or gaining me equity. Now to get some context of those numbers, we're gonna use the land survey that was done for Iowa farmland in 2022 that came out to an average of 11,400 per tillable acre of farmland. And what's pretty interesting to see, that's an increase from the previous year of 17%. Now, in my region of the world, you can see land prices go from $20,000 an acre plus, and probably nothing less, nothing that's purely farmland will go less than 10,000. There'll be a lot of people commenting in this video talking about how much farmland is in their area. And for more context, in 2023, the Iowa cash rent survey came in around $300 for cash rent in my area. Now that can probably go all the way down to 150 and all the way up to, I don't know, 400, but for my land cost, it's 600. And now we're gonna look at our input costs, starting off with tillage. We had to do some field work this spring. Some of the ground was really rough. There were big holes. It hadn't been farmed in many decades. So I ended up running a disc across that. And we're gonna use ISU's 2023 custom farm rates. These are public numbers that you can find online. And the cost of running a disc is $17.55 per acre, which is about $745 that I paid. The disc didn't do the best job, so we came in for one pass of a field cultivator right before we planted, and that came to the same price, $17 per acre, 
or $745. Now right away in the spring, we came out and did some soil sampling. That's pretty important to see like where fertility is at in the field. We spent 5,100 bucks on anhydrous and then 6,300 on dry fertilizer. Keep in mind that's application as well. So that comes out to $11,500 for fertilizer and that's including the custom cost of somebody doing it. I was not there with my equipment doing it. And now it was time to get the seed in the ground. So I borrowed my brother's tractor and planter. A lot of you guys give me a lot of heck for driving it 100 miles up to my place. And so we're gonna include $250 of diesel on you know that round trip and then $250 for wear and tear on the tires and the tractor, stuff like that. In order to grow corn, you need some corn seed. That came out to $5,000 or $118 per acre. Now to be completely transparent, I was super fortunate to use my brother's tractor and planter. I didn't write him a check when I used it. Now I paid for diesel. I was the one in the tractor doing the work, stuff like that. Now we do share a lot of equipment and a lot of the things I do for him with no expectation of a reward or he borrows a piece of equipment from me that I own, um, kind of similar situation. But we're still gonna include that into our cash flow statement. So we're gonna use the custom rate again. That comes to $24 an acre or $1,050 total. Now we also have to pay for crop insurance. That came to $1,200 or $28 per acre. Next, we have to add the cost of spraying. This was custom done. I didn't do any of the work myself. That came out to $4,900 or $116 per acre. In July, when the corn was just about tasseling, we had a drone come out. They put down fungicide in a product called Source. That came out to $2,300 or $56 per acre. Now fast forward to fall time, it's October. The corn's all grown, it's mature, it's starting to dry down, and now we need to harvest it. So once again, I'm borrowing my brother's equipment for this. He has a John Deere 9560 SDS combine. It has a six row corn head on it. Instead of driving it 100 miles, I ended up having a trucker haul it. That came to $650 for the one way trip. The cost of custom combining is $1,750 or $41 per acre. Next, we had the haul the corn in. We used the military dump truck for that, gravity wagons, and that comes to 13 cents per bushel that we bring in or haul and it was about a five mile one way trip. So it was about $1,200 to harvest all the bushels I did and then bring them in. So those were all of our expenses. We had our land costs, then we had our crop input costs, and now we're gonna look at how much did we bring in? How much did we make off the harvest? We went in, we sold our corn. Now we yielded 9,600 bushels of wet corn. We averaged about 18% on moisture that we were bringing out of the field and drying down that corn isn't free. At the point of sale, it cost me about five cents per bushel per point to dry it down. Now I pre-sold 2,000 bushels of corn. Back in June, there was a bit of a drought scare. We didn't have a big rain up until then during the growing season. And for fall delivery, prices went up to $5.54. Now in hindsight, I should have sold a lot more than I did, just those 2,000. You know, I should have sold the 9,000 that we sold in a perfect world, but prices never went up after that, and they all went down from there. Now in case this video gets lots of views, I wanna take a second here and tell you guys about American farming. My brother Grant, you've seen in past videos, he started a software company called Squad Build Inc. about three years ago now. Grant and the team at Squad Build just released their first product, American Farming. It's a mobile farming game. It's kind of based on the Midwest region. It kind of has that feel of the map. There's like a downtown and everything, a main street. And it's like the true American farming operation in a video game. There's livestock such as you can have a pig farm, cattle farm, you can even have a dairy operation. So it's pretty cool, there's lots to do in the game. Now the game isn't free, it is a one-time purchase. It's a, it's a mobile video game, so you can find it on the App Store or Google Play. Now this isn't a paid promotion at all, I just wanted to give a shout out to Grant and the team. I've seen them work super hard on this over you know a few years here now, and just wanted to shout it out and let people know if they're interested. Now back to how much we made. In the end we made $40,400, and that comes out to $4.50 per bushel that we ended up selling at. Now that's after all the drying costs. Like I said earlier, five cents per bushel per point of dry down costs. So as you can tell, our revenue did not meet our expenses, and on paper we lost money in our cash flow statement. It came out to about $16,800, or just under $400 per acre of loss. Now keep in mind, some of the things I did myself, like running the disc, field cultivator, and planting, uh, ISU custom rate kind of factors in what labor would cost. I'm not sure what they use, but on that $16,000 loss, some of that money would be what I would pay myself to uh, sit in the tractor and do the field work. Now personally, I'm gonna look at it, like this year I lost $16,000. And you can click off this video and say how dumb I am for losing that much and tell everybody I lost a bunch of money farming. But I'm gonna throw a bit of speculation in and maybe some people would use what I'm gonna say to kind of justify these land prices and justify you know purchasing land like I did. Now, first thing to lower that number, I didn't pay Grant to use the tractor, the planter, or the combine. So those savings would have came out to $2,800 per acre if I didn't include that into my expenses. And like I said, I didn't write him a check for that. Super fortunate that I didn't have to. And there's a, bu there's a bunch of times I've worked for Grant 
in many years past without any pay, stuff like that, or lent him a piece of my equipment, my truck, whatever it is, and not get any pay. That, we're kind of a team like that, and we work together. And earlier I mentioned there's $9,600 of that land cost that's actually paying down principal. So I like to kind of look at it as a forced savings account, and really that's $9,600 of equity I'm putting into the land. And at some point, it's not liquid at all, I'm not saying it is, but at some point I should be able to get that money back unless land prices totally co collapse and I can't sell it for anything. So minus and off those two, the 16,000 kind of goes down pretty quick and things are looking a bit better. Now something that's pure speculation is land price appreciation. So earlier I said from 2021, what the Iowa land survey went up 17%. Just for fun, let's take my purchase price of $396,000, add 17% increase, let's act like it did it again this year. And that would turn out to $460,000 or $67,000 increase year over year from land price appreciation. And that's not liquid, that's uh, that's all on paper. But what I wanna find out is like what kind of year over year number we can use. That's sure it's all speculation, but it's fairly conservative. Over the past 50 years, since 1973, Iowa land prices have went up 6% year over year. And that 6% is an average. So, you know, 21 to 22, that was 17%. And maybe back in the 80s, it went down 10% one year, 8% one year. So. On average, past 50 years, it's went up 6%, and let's cut that into a third. So I'm gonna use 2% for this. So let's conservatively say my land went up 2% this year. That would be $7,900 increase, which is starting to bring that $16,000 loss down even lower. And let's just say we use 6%, well, that's $23,000 a year. Again, I'm not using that, but I mean, that's what it's done the past 50 years, which is kind of interesting just to think about. And again, it's all illiquid. It's all on paper. I could cash out refinance or I could sell it. But, uh, you know, maybe for the next three years, land goes down 5% year over year. And uh, I'm in a crunch. I need to sell the land. Oh, I lost 15%. But when you kind of factor that in, you can kind of start to justify, you know, buying land. And maybe that's why land prices are so high. Just uh, people get used to the number going up and people keep buying low interest rates. I don't know. I'm just, uh, just saying. So now after the savings from borrowing my brother's tractor and combine, then let's factor in the principal payment and then also the 2% land appreciation. Now it looks like on paper we actually made some money. You could say this year we made $3,400. I'm not going to, I'm just saying, maybe some people do. People look at numbers in all different ways. That's kind of one thing I've discovered when you open up an Excel spreadsheet, track all your stuff. It's probably, uh, it's really good to do it, but don't base your decision fully off that. Now realistically, money out of my pocket was really closer to $14,000, because again, I didn't pay my brother for, for borrowing his equipment, but I like to be more conservative and we'll stick with this, the negative 16,000. Now one thing I haven't talked about is if I ever got a, like an operating loan. Some farmers, you know, it's a lot of money. For example, that fertilizer, the spraying, all that stuff you're paying for the seed, like I already bought seed for next year. And so some farmers borrow money to then pay all their expenses for that year. And I didn't do that, but you could also add that into the expenses um, that some farmers might have. But one thing too to hit on is like the fun enjoyment I got from this year all the learning we did and stuff like that there's no way to factor that in on paper and if you guys want to watch a better video that goes like more in depth Cole the corn star I'll link his video below he spends a lot of time going in much more detail on all this stuff now I want to throw another wrench in this situation and look at how much this YouTube channel made this year and specifically like let's combine that with the revenue off the corn and then how much this YouTube channel made off specifically farming videos on this land. And the whole reason I made this YouTube channel wasn't actually to make any money. It was kind of for the fun of it, document some stuff, look back on, and I actually didn't put any ads on my videos at first. I calculated a while back, I, I missed out on like a thousand to two thousand dollars. Now there's a bunch of ways to make money off YouTube, but we're gonna specifically keep it really simple and just look at AdSense, how much I'm making off per video, Google AdSense. Now the highest view video was 760,000 views and that made 2,600 bucks. And that comes out to $3.53 per 1,000 views. So that's how much revenue I got per 1,000 views, or RPM for short. And a video that got 660,000 views made $3,600 or $5.50 per 1,000 views. And where not all YouTube videos make the same amount of money, also you have different YouTube channels. So like a channel that's about video games in a channel that's solely about like real estate or finances. The real estate and finance channel is gonna make quite a bit more per 1,000 views. But once you find out how much something makes per 1,000 views, then you just take that number and times it by however many views it has. And the total amount of money I made from YouTube videos this year, specifically about farming, came out to $7,800. Now you could take that number, minus it off our 16,000, and say we only lost around $8,000 this year. Or if we add that YouTube money, plus our principal payment, plus the savings we got from using Grant's equipment, 
and then the land appreciation it, on paper we could say that we made eleven thousand dollars this year but all that's just speculation like the appreciation stuff like that i'm not going to look at it that way i'm just saying you could and the total amount of money this channel made this year it comes to about fourteen thousand dollars that's pretty crazy to see that we made that much money off this channel so so far super appreciate all the people that watch watch the videos that wasn't my goal at the beginning of this year and nowhere did i uh did i factor that into my projections for this year i actually like I said, I missed out on, I think, I think around $2,000 because I didn't have ads on my videos. So that kind of gives you an idea once you look at how many views are on some of these videos, how much you could make uh, if you were to start your own YouTube channel. I always kind of tell friends and family, there's there's a million ways to make money online. It's it's a good opportunity. It's, it's, it's honestly a really good side hustle for somebody that's looking to, um, maybe you have a nine to five and you know, you have a couple hours late at night that you're looking to do something to, uh, to start something, YouTube isn't, there's a million different ways. YouTube's just one way, but maybe you're really passionate about one certain niche or topic. Anyway, I just wanted to share those numbers and maybe you guys think those aren't worth worth the time I put into the videos. They actually take quite a bit of time to edit them and stuff, but maybe you guys think, holy cow, $14,000 off making these stupid YouTube videos. That's awesome. I should start it. So anyway, just thought I'd be tr transparent with those numbers and, and yeah, comment below. Let me know if you have any thoughts or different ways of looking at things or things I should do different for next year. So thanks for watching. Appreciate it.